Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today for our second presentation of our Financial Planning Day lineup. Um, this presentation is Best Retirement Savings Plans for You, presented by Heather Liston. Um, I wanna let you all know if you need closed captioning during this program, click on the show captions button at the bottom of the screen, or if the captions are showing and you do not want camp captions, click that and it will make them disappear. Um, during the program, I will be posting some information in the chat about library resources, upcoming programs, ways to get in touch with us, join our mailing list. Uh, so keep an eye out for that. For asking questions, please put those in the chat. Uh, we will be monitoring the chat and answering those either as they come up or at the end during a dedicated Q&A session. Um, without further ado, I am gonna introduce Chris Remedios who uh, will introduce our presenter, Heather. Thanks again, everyone for joining us. And thanks, Chris and Heather. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, I am thrilled to be working with the library uh, again for Financial Planning Day, our annual Financial Planning Day, um, which was started up in 2010. And we have been with the library and in the library at various times since 2014. So this is very exciting to have that consistency and such great people joining. Today, we are really blessed to have Heather Liston uh, doing a presentation on retirement plans. Uh, Heather is a certified financial planner. Um, she's a principal of Clarity Financial, which is based in San Francisco. She's also an enrolled agent, which means that she is a tax professional. And that is a great combo. Um, she has taught income tax, retirement planning, and other subjects at UC Berkeley, UC Santa Cruz, Golden Gate University. And she often speaks to groups and has been a very consistent presenter with the public library, has the most amazing lineup of different topics that she can talk about. So we are really, really fortunate to have Heather today. Um, I am Chris Remedios. I am a certified financial planner here in San Francisco. I, I am here in support of Heather. Uh, we're gonna be having some questions come in through the chat function and Heather will likely answer many of them uh, by speaking, but if there's something that I can handle um, by tech, by uh, writing back, then I will go ahead and do that. So enjoy the presentation, everyone. Thank you so much, Chris. I'm gonna share my screen. And right now you should see a blue PowerPoint slide. If anyone doesn't, you'll let us know, right? Okay, good. Thank you so much. I want everybody to know Chris Remedios has been a huge force not huge in a bad way. Um, <laughs> she's been a powerhouse about um, supporting Financial Planning Day over the years and making sure that it works well. And someone else, one of the other volunteers was saying this is her favorite day of the year. I agree. It is such a fun opportunity to be able to meet people who are looking for help and are approaching their financial lives thoughtfully. Chris makes that happen for all of us. And Jonathan and the other library staff also have just been wonderful about this. So I enjoy it. I'm glad you're here. And I hope we can answer all your questions about retirement plans today. Um, this is one of my favorite cartoons. I always keep it in presentations because you know, there was a time when retirement planning wasn't such an urgent issue because people would get a job with a corporation and the company would pay them a pension for the rest of their lives. That's very rare now, unless you are a public school teacher or one of a few other lucky types of people, it's very unlikely you have a pension, which means we still want you to have a nice retirement, but you're gonna have to be active and look out for yourself. So that's how we wanna look at this today. Um, as I was just telling Chris, I have enough material in my slideshow for at least a semester long course on retirement planning. So these are some of the topics that I would like to cover today, but I wanna know what's most important to you because chances are we won't get to everything. So if there is something on your mind that you really wanna make sure we cover, please just type it briefly in the chat. That'll help me stay focused on what really matters to you. Um, so. We're going to talk a little bit, and I'll just explain my overview here while you chat, chat your, type your chat notes. We're going to talk a little bit about why we do retirement planning and what it's all about. We're going to talk about the various plan types, 401ks, IRAs, Roths, 
plans that you have through your job, through your individual business, through your small business. We'll talk about the rules. Who's eligible? What are the income limits? What are the contribution limits? When do you have to withdraw? There is a new program in California called Cal Savers. I want to talk about that. It's particularly for small employers and for people who don't have another way to save for retirement. The savers credit is very important for low income people. I would definitely want to get to that. And then there's a few advanced topics. Sometimes people are um, attracted to these just because of the funny names. But we've got a backdoor Roth, a mega backdoor, and a 529 to Roth maneuver. So we might not get to those unless you tell me it's important. Um, <laughs> okay. Oh, someone says order of what we should be maxing out. That is an interesting question. Yes, I'll jot that down. Although I'll also try to give you a quick answer now. Probably if you have a choice, like let's say you have a 401k at work and an IRA on the side, I would usually max out your workplace plan first because it's so easy. You just have money withheld from your paycheck. Setting up an IRA and funding it sometimes has additional complications. Okay, someone says, is a government bond a good investment? Um, that's not exactly today's topic, but the answer is yes. What's good about government bonds is they are essentially risk-free. Um, however, they don't tend to return a lot of, a lot of um, return over the years like stocks. So that's really more of an investment question, but my answer would be have a little of everything, including government bonds. Okay, which and how many retirement plans can we contribute to in a year? Okay, yeah, super good question. How does the 4% match work? Jot that down, matches. Um, let's see what else we've got. How do I meet the match? Um, someone wants to know if 457 rules are the same as 401k. Almost, but not quite. I will try to get to that. Um, I'm going to interrupt for just a quick second. There's some questions that are coming up about the recording. The recording is indeed happening and it will be available on the library YouTube channel. And also Jonathan will be sending a link. So I just wanted to make that clear. Thank you. That's important. Okay, good. Okay, I'm going to look for one or two more questions. Can I discuss the backdoor Roth and the pro rata rule? Probably. If we, yeah, um, probably we can do that. Backdoor Roths are... Um, can be complicated. So let's see how to withdraw from a Roth IRA. Okay, good. That gives me enough overview that we can get started. So this is the answer to why do retirement plans exist? Um, this is a quotation from Sen the late Senator Paul Wellstone of Minnesota. He said, we all do better when we all do better. One of my favorite political quotes of all time. So the reason we have retirement plans is because not only do we want ourselves and our family taken care of when we're old, we want our friends and neighbors and the other people living in our city to be taken care of when they're old. Um, that's why we have social security and it's why we have retirement plans. It's because it's better for all of us if we're not going hungry in old age. And without pensions, we need to do more planning for ourselves but the government, the IRS, the Senate have set up these various types of plans that give us tax breaks and encourage us to save for retirement because it's better for everybody when we have a healthy and productive old age. So what makes the official retirement plans worth the trouble? In other words, you could save for retirement just by putting cash in your freezer or the proverbial under your mattress. Those are in a sense retirement plans. But these official things we refer to as retirement plans like 401ks and IRAs, what makes them particularly good is number one, they have tax advantages. Number two, they provide an opportunity for systematic savings. We as human beings have difficulty saving money sometimes. It's hard to say, well, you know, whatever's left over, I'll put that in the freezer, I'll put that in the 401k. With an official retirement plan through your job, you don't have to think too much. You sign up at the beginning of the year, you say withhold X dollars from every paycheck. You don't have to think again, which is great. The less thinking, the better. So you're not gonna forget to get the savings done. You're not gonna wait and see what's left over at the end of the year. It's gonna go in systematically. Another advantage to the systematic savings through a workplace plan is you're gonna automatically do what we call dollar cost averaging. Now, for those of you who went to the investment um, talk this morning, which I'm sure was very good, I've heard her before, um, you probably know that our instincts do not always work in our best um, interests when we're saving and when we're investing. So for example, if I wake up in the morning and I see the stock market has plummeted, 
you know, maybe there was a Brexit vote, maybe the election went some weird way, all of a sudden there's a stock market crash. I'm going to feel really nervous. I'm not going to want to invest, even though that's exactly the day I should invest because everything's on sale. Um, this systematic savings through your 401k saves you from that kind of overthinking that works against you. Dollar cost averaging means because you're buying every week or every two weeks automatically, you're buying at different points in the stock market. You're getting some things at a low price, some things at a higher price. You're not making a bet on any particular date. So tax advantages and systematic savings are both just hugely valuable, and it's why it's a good idea to use the retirement plans available to you. You'll notice under tax advantages, I wrote save taxes now and save taxes later. So exactly how the tax advantages work are do differ between plants, primarily between the two big categories of plants. Um, there's different ways to categorize it. Um, one type of category is workplace plan versus individual plans like IRAs. But another really important distinction is some are pre-tax or what we call usually traditional. Like you've probably heard of a traditional IRA. And other plans are what we call Roth. R-O-T-H, it's named for a senator named William Roth who first proposed this idea. Um, but basically Roth plans can you can have a Roth 401k, you can have a Roth IRA, you can have a Roth 457. Roth means you do not get a tax break now, but your money grows tax free over time. We'll come back to that if you didn't quite get that. But I wanna make the distinction here that some things save you tax now, those are called traditional or pre-tax plans. Some things save you a lot of tax in the long run, those are called Roth type plans. Now, there's a chance I've already triggered some confusion. So I'm going to peek and see if I've got new questions. Okay, someone mentions the backdoors and megas. Okay, fine. We'll keep going. All right. Um, so rules of the universe. Again, this is the big overview. Why do we do this? Number one, it's always good to reduce your taxes. Number two, when you have money withheld from your paycheck, you don't miss it as much as you think you will. It is very hard to get your take-home pay and then save some of it. But if you have some withheld, you're already having a lot of things withheld from your paycheck for taxes and health insurance and all kinds of other things. If you have a little more withheld for your retirement, you're probably not even going to notice it. And it's not going to be as much withheld as you think. For example, if I say, please withhold $1,000 from each paycheck and put that into my retirement account, my take home pay is not going to go down by $1,000 because it's pre-tax money. My take-home pay may go down by six or $700, but it's not going to go down by the whole amount. So you're not going to miss it as much as you think you will, and your savings will grow faster than you expect. Okay, reasons to participate. Tax-deferred contribution, tax-deferred or tax-free savings and growth, automatic savings, the chance to retire someday, and because it's a valuable part of your compensation. If you take a job with a company, chances are today they will have a 401k or maybe a 403B or a few other possibilities, but most often it's a 401k. That is a valuable part of your compensation. Your company paid someone to set that up, make it work because it's valuable. And so for you to let it go to waste is not a good idea. Reasons not to participate. Um, the only reasons not to participate in your 401k or other plans are because you enjoy paying as much tax as possible, you already have so much money you can't imagine what you'd do if you had more, or you love your job so much you hope you never have to retire. Those are the only reasons for not participating in your company retirement plan. All right, real reasons people don't participate. Those first sound almost sound like a joke, but I've been an HR director. I've tried to convince people to sign up and had them refuse. So the real reasons are very often they would like get started and then they say, oh, I got to ask my wife. I don't understand how this works. So in fact, you're the smart one in the family. I want you to go ahead and do this. Talking to your spouse is fine, but don't let that delay you. Don't say, oh, I got to check with the family. I don't know. I'll decide later. Start now. Okay. Sometimes people don't sign up because they don't know what funds to invest in. That is a common issue. In fact, one of the most interesting books I ever read about behavioral finance is one about choice. Um, someone did a study and she found that the number one reason people don't participate in their 401k is they are overwhelmed by how many choices of funds they have. So don't let that slow you down. Any fund is better than no fund. And 
most 401ks today, I think I can safely say most, have a default option. It's usually some kind of target date fund. And so, for example, if you choose the 2050 target date fund or something like that, your money will automatically be invested partly in stocks, partly in bonds, partly in U.S., partly in international. So you don't have to think too much. Not thinking too much is good. And it is better to do something than nothing. So don't let that overwhelming choice of funds slow you down. Um, you may think there are more interesting things to do today, but that's false. As Chris and others know, there is nothing more fun than financial planning. If you feel over your head, ask someone for help. Ask your HR director. If you can afford to hire a planner, that's great. If you can't, keep going to free library talks. The library really has a wonderful series, not just today, but throughout the year, of people who will talk to you about how to make investment decisions and things like that. And the fact is, yes, retirement plans can be a little complicated, but a lot of our goal today is to help get you started on the simple parts of it. The advanced tricks like the mega back door, if you don't have time to think about that, that's okay. We want you to get you started on the simpler parts. Okay, um, we've already talked about this. One key concept, tax-free versus tax-deferred. Very important, tax-deferred, is what we normally refer to as traditional, and tax-free is Roth. That's pretty much synonymous. The word Roth is used throughout different types of plans to mean money that grows tax-free. So tax-deferred means you get a tax deduction right now. For a long time, almost all 401ks were tax-deferred. So you would say, put X dollars into my um, 401k plan, and you would not pay tax on that in the current year, which is great. With those traditional types of, of accounts, whether it's an IRA or a 401k or a 403b, if it's a traditional pre-tax, you're going to save tax money right now, which is great. In general, saving money now is better than saving money later. So tax, free, tax deferred right now is great. Now, with those tax deferred ones, though, what happens is later when you're retired and you start taking money out of those accounts, you're going to pay tax on the full amount when you take it out. You're going to pay tax at your ordinary rate at the time, um, and you're going to pay tax on the entire amount you take out. Doesn't matter if that amount you're taking out was from your contributions, was from dividends and interest over time, was from growth in your investments over time, whatever it is, you pay tax on the full amount when you take it out. So that's fine. And part of the logic of that is we hope that right now while you're working, you're making a lot of money and it's worthwhile to really reduce your taxes now. Later, when you're retired, you may be living on a much lower income, and so you will be in a lower tax bracket. Taking out your retirement money then makes a lot of sense. But then tax-free or Roth accounts, also super valuable. Roth account, you do not save tax money right now. With a Roth account, you put in money right now, doesn't change your taxes right now. But the beauty of it is, when that money is invested and earns dividends and interest and capital gains, you never pay tax on that growth and income. That's actually an incredible benefit. And a lot of people have done studies. Every Actually, it's a fun thing to study to try to prove which one is better. And the answer is, first of all, the most important thing to know is they're both great. So this is another decision that I don't want you to let slow you down. And my solution to everything, I learned this from my father in the context of ice cream. If you can't decide, have some of everything, okay? In fact, we have a rule in my family. On my father's birthday, every year, we all go out for ice cream. And the only rule is you have to get at least two flavors. That's how we honor our father. So I do the same thing with investments. If you can't decide, stop thinking about it and just get some of both. Now, in general terms, if you're in a very high tax bracket now, which many people in the Bay Area are, if you're working in Silicon Valley, you may have an outrageously high salary. If that's true, I want you to put the, your first $23,000 into the traditional tax deferred because it's very valuable for you to save a lot of money right now. If you're young and it's your first job or for any reason, if your income right now is low, I want you to put money in the Roth. Because lowering your tax bracket right now doesn't make that much difference, but you're going to be rich later when you're old, and I want your money to be tax-free. So again, very high income, put your money in traditional. Low income, put your money in Roth. 
If you can't decide, stop thinking about it and just do some of both. They're all great. Okay, so here's the answer to that. They're both great. Um, going to speed up a little bit. Okay, overview of plan types. Heather, can I interrupt for yeah. just a quick second? Um, and maybe I got off track here, but there was a question about the eligibility to contribute to both a traditional and a Roth IRA. W were you focused just on the 401k or, or IRAs as well? Um, both. And we will talk okay. about the income limits and when you can contribute to both. Um, but in terms of whether it should be Roth or traditional, at this point, both 401ks and, and IRAs and even 403bs, at this point, most plans offer you both options. So whether it's a 401k or an IRA or a 403b or whatever, you're going to be making that traditional versus Roth decision with all of them. But yes, we will get to that question of can you contribute to both types of plans at once. Yeah, I just wanted to throw out there because this question was very specific that for the IRAs themselves, it is restricted to the total contribution of the 6,000 or the 7,000 to a combined amount to Roth and traditional. Yes. Yeah, that's important. Okay, thank you. Um, you can open as many IRA accounts as you want. Um, you could have, you know, one Roth IRA, one traditional IRA, or you could have three traditional IRAs, but no matter how many you open, how many IRAs you open, your limit for the year for 2024, the total amount you can put in an IRA in 2024 is $7,000. Doesn't matter if you have one account or 10 accounts, the total amount is $7,000. Fun fact about that, um, what does IRA stand for? You probably think you know. The New York Times got this wrong recently in their crossword puzzle. IRA does not stand for individual retirement account because it's not about the one account you have at Vanguard or Fidelity or whatever. IRA stands for Individual Retirement Arrangement. The reason that the word nerd in me likes to um, focus on that is your arrangement with the government is that you get to deduct $7,000 worth of IRAs during the year if you want to. They don't care how many accounts you put it in. It's between you and the government, how much you have in your overall IRA arrangement, okay? Okay, so types of plans. For individuals, we have IRAs come in traditional and Roth. From employers, 401ks is the most common type. We also have 403bs. A 403b is available sometimes to nonprofits and government agencies. In every aspect that matters to you, a 403b and a 401k are pretty much identical now. They used to be more different. Now they're really not. So anytime I say 401k, if you have a 403b, it applies to you too. The distinctions are no longer important. 457 is a little bit different. And I know we have at least one person on the line who has a 457. So we will get to more about that. Um, it's great. Um, essentially, a 457 is something that you can have, again, at a... Um, nonprofit organization and or a government organization, um, it's always up to the organization whether they're going to have one. So if you work for a nonprofit and they don't offer you a 457, sorry, they just don't. That's their decision. But if they do, you can be enrolled in both your 403B and your 457. 409As are less common unless you're a top executive. That's a non- um, qualified deferred compensation plan. It's a little beyond our scope. But if you have a 409A, I would suggest you do talk to an advisor and try to make take advantage of that too. But again, the primary employer type is the 401k. For small businesses, the SEP IRA, the solo 401k, and the simple IRA are all good. So more details, employer plans, 401ks, et cetera. Um, I think I already told you this, that 401ks, almost any type of company, it's very common now. It's very unlikely that your company won't offer you a 401k if you get a regular job. Um, 401ks and 403bs usually now have both a pre-tax and a Roth option. Sometimes they have an after-tax option in addition to a Roth. That's quite confusing because Roth money is after-tax money. And yet there's this third category called after tax. That's not super common. Um, we can talk more about that at the end. But for now, most companies will offer you a pre-tax and a Roth option. The total amount you can put in the pre-tax plus the Roth, 23000 If you're over 50, 
it's $30,500 for 2024. If you're, if you're under 50, it's 23,000. And you can divide that up any way you want between the pre-tax and the Roth sections of your plan. Um, so here's, here's those limits, 23,000 if you're under 50, um, an additional 7,500 if your 50th birthday occurs on or before December 31st of this year for a total of 30,500 if you're 50 or over. Um, your employer may or may not offer a plan. They may or may not match your contributions um, and they may or may not let you make loans from your plan. Um, don't let any of these things stop you from contributing. I did talk to a client recently who said, oh, we don't bother with our 401k because there's no match. Don't let that stop you. A match is wonderful. I love when clients tell me that their company gives them a good match to their 401k, but it's still a wonderful plan even without a match. So don't let that slow you down. Now, um, withdrawals. Sorry, I'll jump to that later. Okay, so in general, any retirement plan in general you can withdraw your money without penalty when you are more than 59 and a half years old. But one special thing about a 401k or 403b, <clears throat> after 2009, a new rule that came in during the financial crisis to help people out was if it's the workplace plan from your current employer and you are 55 or older, you can take the money out without penalty after you leave that employer. The reason this came about is if it was 2008 or 2009 and you lost your job, a lot of people were losing their jobs. If you remember the financial crisis, it was a scary time around 08 and 09. A lot of people got laid off. If you were over 55 and got laid off, you were probably retired whether you wanted to be or not. And so um, they did lower the age. So you can take money out of your current job plan if you leave that job and you are 55 or older. Now that can be a good reason to consider if you have old 401ks from old jobs, you might wanna consider rolling them into your current plan because that will give you more flexibility about when you can take the money out without penalty. If it's in an old plan, you have to be 59 and a half. If it's in your current plan, you got a few more years leeway. Little bit of a side topic, but an interesting thing to think about. Okay, my recommendation, maximize your contributions if at all possible. And that means put in $23,000. I often talk to people who say, oh, we're great savers. We're having 5% of our checks withheld for our 401k. Well, you know, if you make a million dollars a year, 5% is probably maybe getting you to the 23,000. But if you make less than that, I want you to try to get to 23,000. And this is a fun fact not everybody knows. You should maximize your 401k contributions even if you are saving for your children's education. The reason for that is if you are middle class or below, you may be saying, oh my goodness, I can't afford to pay for everything. My children are my top priority. I'm going to open a bank account and put in money for their education. I commend you for thinking of their education, but if you are applying for financial aid and you're filling out the federal government form, the FAFSA, they're not going to count your retirement money against you. And again, that goes back to the rule that we all do better when we all do better. No one wants you to live in the poor house so that your kids can go to school. So it is fine to take care of yourself first. Same as the airplane rule. Take, put on your own oxygen mask first. So if you don't feel like you can fund everything and you're worried about your children's education, go ahead and fund your 401k anyway, because it will not count against you for financial aid. So super important. Now, if you're still saying, Heather, I still cannot come up with the $23,000 from my family's cash flow, I get it. It's not easy for everyone, but definitely make sure you get the full employer match because that is absolutely free money. If your employer says we will match 100% of your contributions up to 3% of your salary or whatever they say, you better get 3% of your salary in that. I'm going to tell you one sad story from my days as an HR director. Um, there was a woman who worked for our company. She um, was 60 years old. So she's over the 59 and a half year limit to be able to withdraw without penalty. Our company allowed for in-service withdrawals. That means you were allowed to take money out while you still worked there. And we offered a 5% match. 
I could not get her to contribute to the 401k plan because she just couldn't understand it. She kept saying, oh, I don't know if I have enough to spare. I said, if you put money in from your paycheck today, the company will match it. You'll get an extra 5%, which she made about 100,000 a year. So that was about $5,000. And then you can withdraw the money tomorrow and it's all your money. And she still said, well, maybe after my daughter's wedding. So that's very confused thinking. This match is absolutely free money. You earned it. You have a right to it. Make sure you get it. Okay. If your employer offers any kind of a match, and if you have any trouble understanding it, either ask your smartest colleague or check with your HR director, say, what do I have to do to make sure I'm getting the maximum match? Okay. More about less common employer plans. The 457B, which someone did ask about, it's only for nonprofits and government organizations. Of course, they're not required to have it, but they might have it. What's brilliant about the 457B is the double dip. What that means is, I told you there's a $23,000 limit to your 401k. That $23,000 is the limit for you, even if you have three different jobs during the year, even if you have two jobs at the same time, $23,000. The only exception to that is if you have access to a 401k or 403b and a 457, you can put 23,000 in each one. Now, I do understand there are people on this call who say, I can't spare $46,000 from take home pay. I totally get it. But if for any reason you can spare that kind of money, it's fantastic. The 457 allows you to double your tax advantage savings for the year. So I would definitely consider it if you can. Um, if anyone works for the University of California, they offer a 457 plan throughout the um, whole system. It's very valuable. Um, more about that later when we come to withdrawals and things, because there's a few other fun things about a 457. But for the moment, to make sure we can- Can I interrupt real yes. quick about that? Um, so there's a question about what um, would stop an employer from offering both a 403B and a 457. I just wanted to get your take. My What I see is that mostly very large employers like the UC system might offer it, but not, not just regular average everyday employers. The reason that for someone not to do it is the administrative hassle, right? Your company has to be able to afford a benefits administrator who can set this up. That's the main reason. Now, if you're at a company that's a nonprofit or a government organization, and you think they have the manpower to manage it, by all means, go to your HR director and say, hey, could we have a 457? <laughs> you never know. Like it. Or if you're starting your own nonprofit, keep it in mind. Um, yeah, but usually it's just the administrative work of do they have someone who could administer it? And when I started my career, 401ks were very uncommon. But at this point, I think every employer knows you're not you're not going to go work for them if they don't have a 401k. It's become expected and demanded. 457s are not the, at that level yet where everybody demands them. But so primarily just administrative hassle. Okay, let's get into IRAs, super important. Individual retirement arrangements, which you already know, that's what it stands for. There are several types. The basic um, difference is traditional versus Roth. But other ways to think about it are, you could have a traditional IRA that is non-deductible. The reason for that, the only reason to do a non-deductible IRA is if you make too much money that you can't legally contribute to a deductible traditional IRA. More about that later if we have time for the backdoor thing. And then there are employer-sponsored IRAs, the SEP IRA and the simple IRA. These two are a little weird because they're sort of hybrids. In some instances, they count as an employer plan. In some instances, they count as an IRA. Sort of complicated. Um, but if you are, say, um, on your own, if you don't have a workplace plan, you're going to be looking at the traditional or the Roth IRA. Or if you have a workplace plan, but you have enough cash that you want to maximize your workplace plan and contribute to an IRA, you're going to be looking at these. If you're self-employed or work for a small business, you may be looking at one of these, the SEP or the SIMPLE. Okay, other subsets of the traditional IRA, there's the rollover IRA. That's when you left your old job and you wanted to get the money out of your 401k, you can roll that into an IRA. That rollover will be either traditional or Roth, depending on what the money was in, in the 401k. Um, or there's the inherited IRA. Now, I mentioned that one here, just the fact that if your inherited IRA is at Fidelity, they call it a BDA, 
That stands for beneficiary distribution account. Don't let that confuse you. That's just fidelity special term for inherited IRA. Um, what's different about an inherited IRA versus an IRA you contribute to on your own is what we call RMDs, required minimum distributions. For your own IRAs that you contributed to yourself or you rolled out of another job, usually you don't have to start taking money out until you're old, 72, 73, or 75. Um, but if you have an inherited IRA where someone else saved the money and your mother or your grandfather or your neighbor or somebody left it to you, you probably have required minimum distributions that begin sooner. So these are all various types of IRAs. Um, should we take a minute for, are there any urgent questions where I'm confusing anyone? <laughs> okay. Thank you, Chris, for reminding us that although I talk fast, there will be a recording. Um, thank you for that. And okay, so moving on then, the traditional IRA rules. In 2024, you can contribute up to $7,000. If you're 50 or older, total of $8,000. Withdrawals without penalty when you are 59 and a half years old. If you have to take the money out for some reason before you're 59 and a half, the first thing I would do is check the exceptions. I didn't list them all here, but there are a few exceptions to 59 and a half. For example, if you became personal, uh, permanently disabled or if you were buying your first house, <laughs> there's this quote, first time home buyers exception. Um, it has not been adjusted for inflation, so it wouldn't help much in the Bay Area, but you can take $10,000 out um, without penalty if you haven't bought a house in the last couple of years. So there's a few exceptions like that. But in general, you wanna be 59 and a half before you take the money out. If you take it out early, there's a 10% federal penalty and also a two and a half percent California penalty if you are California. So try not to take anything out early. This is your long-term savings. Um, income limits for a traditional IRA. If you are single and make more than $77,000 in what we call adjusted gross income, um, an AGI or adjusted gross income is a number on your tax return. So if you have no idea what your AGI is, get out your 1040, your tax form from last year, look at the line on the first page that says adjusted gross income, that'll give you an idea what your AGI is. So if your AGI is more than 77,000, if you're single or more than 123,000, if you're married filing jointly, um, and you have a workplace plan, you cannot contribute to a deductible traditional IRA. Note that these apply only if you have access to a retirement plan at work. So if you have a job with no 401k, you can ignore these income limits completely and go ahead and contribute to an IRA, a traditional IRA, no problem. Um, and they only apply if it's a deductible traditional IRA. So anybody can put money in a traditional IRA and not deduct it. Usually not worth the trouble. Again, the backdoor Roth is the only reason it's worth the trouble, and that's a little complicated. So setting that aside for now, if you have a workplace plan and you make more than these amounts, don't contribute directly to a traditional IRA. If you are married filing separately, no IRAs for you. Now, married filing separately is a status that almost never makes sense in California. So you probably shouldn't be doing it anyway. But if you do do it for any reason, remember, no IRA contributions. That confuses people sometimes, and I've had to undo some IRAs. Okay, non-deductible contributions can be made to a traditional IRA, no income limits. Anybody can do it. But um, when you withdraw that money later from a non-deductible, if you just put money in a non-deductible IRA and let it sit there for years, that's fine. When you take the money out, the amount that was your original contribution, your $7,000 a year or whatever, no further taxes because you already paid tax on it, your any investment earnings when you take it out would be taxed at withdrawal at whatever is your ordinary rate at the time. Moving on to the next category, Unless Chris tells me, have I lost anyone? No, I answered something on the side and mistyped. So you're going to go through Roth IRAs. It was about taking out, um, taking withdrawals from Roth, but I'm sure you're going to cover this. Yes. So go ahead. Okay, Roths are next. So um, Roth IRA is part of your individual retirement arrangement. So again, that $7,000 limit replies to all your IRAs. 
whether it's Roth or traditional. And, you know, if you want to put 3,500 in one and 3,500 in the other, if you meet the other requirements, totally fine. But you couldn't put $7,000 in each in one year. You could put $7,000 in a Roth this year and a traditional next year. Alternating is fine. But $7,000 is your total IRA limit. Same with the other over 50 catch up of an extra $1,000. Um, with withdrawals, you do need to be over 59 and a half. There's an additional rule to get the benefits of a Roth, which is you should have had that Roth IRA for at least five years. That does not mean all your contributions have to be five years old. It means the account basically has to be five years old. So if you are saying to yourself right now, oh, I'd love to contribute, but I don't have $7,000, that's fine. Keep in mind that you know, we tend to think in terms of maximums when we're in this business because we want to make sure people don't go over the maximum, but you are welcome to do less than the maximum. You can open a Roth IRA this year, put in $100, big deal. You've got it started. That is a big deal. You're to be congratulated if you put in $100 into your Roth IRA. Not only have you got started that tax-free growth for the long term, but also you have started your five-year clock. So then later, when you're old and you're going to take out the money, you don't even need to think about the five-year thing because you've already, we call it seasoning. You've already met this five-year seasoning rule because you put in $100 when you were 29 years old or 18 years old or whatever. So it's a good idea to start a Roth fairly young if for only that reason, even if you're not sure you can contribute every year or contribute a lot. Same penalties for early withdrawal, but also if you withdraw early, you lose that tax benefit of that tax-free growth, which by the way, is incredibly valuable. If you leave your money in a Roth over the long term and you invest it aggressively, so it's earning a lot of return, getting to take out that money tax-free later, unbelievably valuable. Um, income limits for a Roth IRA are higher than for a traditional IRA. The income limit, if you are single and you make your adjusted gross income is less than 146,000, you can put in the full amount into a Roth IRA. If you're married filing jointly and your adjusted gross income is less than 230,000, put in the full amount. Um, so that's great. Another difference between Roths and traditional is these income limits for a Roth apply regardless of whether you have a workplace plan or not. You'll notice no little footnotes here. With the traditional IRA, the income limits don't matter if you don't have a workplace plan. With the Roth, these always matter. Now. Many people, perhaps some of you, make less than $146,000 a year. Fantastic. Then you can contribute the full amount into your Roth IRA so easily. You just go on the Vanguard website or the Schwab website or wherever you want to do it, Empower, whatever. You set up an account, you put in $7,000 or $100, and you are done. Um, the reason I'm stressing that a lot of people make less than $146,000 is some people in the Bay Area forget that because a few people around here make phenomenally high compensation packages. I'm not one of them. So I feel for you if you're not making more than $146,000 a year. Um, the reason I mention it is there's this very complicated maneuver called a backdoor Roth that I know some of you have heard of because you've already asked questions about it. The backdoor Roth is a legal trick for people with high income to get money into Roth IRAs. If you have a high income, by all means, talk to your tax professional, get the details on the backdoor Roth and get it done. If you do not have a high income, just ignore that whole complicated mishigas. I hope I'm using that word right. And just go in through the front door and put money in your Roth IRA. One of the biggest mistakes I've seen people make is they hear all about the backdoor Roth. They say, oh, I got to do that. They go through all these crazy maneuvers that actually make things worse for them. And they didn't need to because their income wasn't that high. If your income is below these levels, forget you ever heard the word backdoor. Just put money in your Roth and be done with it. And there will be no complications and it'll work out great. Now, I'm not supposed to promote myself here, and I'm not, but I'm going to tell you this just because um, I just want you to know that on my website, there are two documents that I think are very relevant to today's talk. One is called How Not to Mess Up Your Backdoor Roth, and the other is called um, Do I Have to Roll Over My Old 401k?
They're both directly related to the topics we're talking about today. They're both free. My website is clarityfinancialca.com and you're welcome to go download those documents if you want. So if you have, or if you send me an email later, I'll send them to you. Um, so if, if you have any questions about the backdoor Roth and whether you qualify, I would make sure to check the front door first. Okay. Um, this is what's so great about the Roth. In the year you withdraw from a Roth, you pay absolutely no income tax. Um, all increases are tax-free. Brilliant plan. Okay, small business plans. Um, I don't know how many people here are self-employed. So I think I'm going to rush through this part a little bit. I would be happy to do another talk sometime on just small business plans, which I often do for realtors because many of them are self-employed. Um, but there's a lot of detail here that may not be as relevant for you as some other things. What I will tell you in simple terms, if you have a small business and you have no employees or your only employee is your spouse, open a solo 401k. If you are a small business owner and you have employees, open a SEP IRA. Those are the two most popular types of small business plans. Solo is better for certain reasons. Solo lets you contribute more, but you only qualify if you and your spouse are the only employees. So in that case, open a solo 401k. If you have employees, open a SEP IRA. I'm going to jump Heather, do you want to just maybe touch on um, having a solo 401k or a SEP and then potentially also having other business activities? So as a business, your profit sharing piece could go to the SEP or a solo 401k, but not both. Um, I feel like I already said my piece about that, which is okay. if you have employees, open a SEP. If you don't have employees, open a solo. Now, I think what Chris is saying, I wouldn't contribute to both in the same year. It's not impossible, but it, or is it, it might be impossible. I, I think it's, I think you can't um, because yeah, it's the same calculation. I and then there's- contribute to both yeah. in the same year. Okay. If you qualify for a solo, I'd open a solo because the solo 401k allows you to save a lot of money probably up to $69,000 a year tax advantage, maybe up to 76,500. So if you and your spouse are the only employees, open a solo. If you have other employees, you're not allowed to have a solo, so open a SEP. Does that answer that or not? Uh, yeah. Okay. This is a, so for any business owner, what I would suggest is go talk to your tax person and run the numbers on how your business is performing with profits and what your contribution um, allowances are. Because as Heather said, there's, you can contribute more usually to a solo 401k than you can to the SEP. But it's dependent on how your business is performing. In other words, you have to have profits to have that profit sharing or that share of the profits piece? Um, I think that's an unnecessary complication in that you need okay. profits for either type of contribution, whether it's the SEP or the solo. So I would stick to my guns, which is get a solo if you qualify and if you don't get a SEP and they're both good. And the solo, now there are also some calculators online. If you want to double check that for yourself, I think I even include a link to one. Um, just Google solo versus SEP and you can type in things that there's several different calculators, but you can type in and you can say, I'm 49 years old, my business earned $98,000 and it will show you, here's how much you could put in a solo, here's how much you can put in a SEP. But essentially the solo is going to be more as long as you qualify. Okay. I also want to respond to the listing of Clarity's uh, website mm -hmm. for everyone on the call. It, it And I, I know Heather very well, so she is not self-promoting. But the purpose of Financial Planning Days is to give you in give you advice that is absolutely free of any sort of string. So if you go to her site, make sure that you download those resources that she's indicated. But this is not a call to uh, have to create a business between the two of you. Thank you. Yes, that's true. And also, it's not the kind of website where you can't get anything unless you give me your email. Nothing like that. Nothing like that. You can secretly download the stuff with no further interaction. But thank you, Chris. I also yeah. want this to be, of course, no strings attached in any way. Absolutely. That is the thank spirit you. of uh, Financial Planning Day. Thank you.
Yeah. Yeah. I'm not going to send you texts or offer you 15% off your next fleece jacket. Nothing like that. It's just documents. Okay. Now, solo 401k, one of the confusing things about that is every company calls it something different. So just so you know, if you call Schwab and they say, oh, do you mean an I 401k? You do. I stands for individual in their case. These are all exactly the same thing. Okay. Solo 401ks. Um, so who can it cover? This is the key thing. Only you and your spouse. Um, okay, again, skipping through those about why they're different. All right, we want to get to a couple other topics. One is there's a new plan called Cal Savers. This is for employers in the state of California who are not offering another type of retirement plan. I think these days a 401k is very much expected when you take a job. So it's fairly rare that you would ever consider taking a regular job that doesn't have a 401k. But if your employer is in that position where they're not offering a 401k yet, um, they are required to make it possible for you to join Cal Savers. So I quoted this here from the Cal Savers site. It's the California Retirement Savings Program for workers who do not have a way to save for retirement at work. Essentially what it is, is an IRA that you own, but your employer withholds money from your paychecks to fund that IRA. So it's to kind of create sort of like a little 401k, but mostly it obeys IRA rules. So for example, you are limited to that $7,000 per year or 8,000 if you're over 50. Um, you have to be an employee in California. You have to be at least 18 years old. You have to have a social security number or an ITIN. Um, no minimum requirements for the hours worked or your level of pay or anything like that. Um, money's withheld from your paychecks and put in an IRA that belongs to you. It's going to be automatic if you work for one of these employers. You will be automatically enrolled if you don't opt out within 30 days. But even after you're automatically enrolled, you can opt out anytime. You can say, no, I don't want to participate, and you'll come out. Um, you can change the amount anytime the account belongs to you and stays with you, even if you change jobs. It's a Roth IRA. That means you're not saving taxes at the time, but it will have tax-free growth. Um, one thing that Chris alerted me to before I even did my research is the fees are kind of high. Um, there is an account fee of $4.50 per quarter, which is $18 a year. So I do not love this plan. Um, if you have other options, like if you can fund your own IRA, do that instead. And then if your employer says, hey, we've got the Cal Savers, you say, sorry, can't participate. I've already got my own IRA and I can only do one IRA. So this will be helpful to some people who maybe have not thought about retirement savings, who don't know how it works, don't know how to set it up. But I would say this is the plan of last resort. If you can arrange something else, do, because these fees are kind of high. and We don't like fees. Okay. Um, also, if you participate in the Cal Savers, um, there is a default uh, savings plan. They're going to put you in the money market fund for 30 days, and they're, then they're going to move you to a target date retirement fund. But you can also override that if you want and select your own investments for it. So defaults are nice because they save us from our own laziness. But if you've got a better plan, like um, opening your own IRA, that's probably better. And if you work for a company with a 401k, this doesn't even apply to you. This is for mostly small employers who haven't yet set up a 401k. Okay, we're getting near the end of our time. I think we're gonna still have time for some Q&A, but one other topic I wanted to make sure we talked about was the savers credit. This is a very valuable thing. And one reason I really love to get it out in situations like this is people who qualify for the savers credit are relatively low income. So they are people who probably do not have a financial advisor and might not know about it. So I want you to help spread the word to your friends who are young or early in their careers about the savers credit. Um, what it is, is it's a tax credit that's essentially free money. It's kind of a rebate to low income people who start saving for retirement. I think it's a wonderful plan because it's so easy for those of us who are not earning a lot or who are young or new to say, oh, I can't think about retirement savings. I barely make enough to pay the rent. This is to remind us that no, everybody should be saving for retirement. And if you don't have a lot of money, we're going to help you. So you get the savers credit if you are 18 or over, if you're not a dependent of someone else and not a full-time student. Um, and it can be a credit of up to $1,000, depending on your adjusted gross income. So here's the chart. If you are 
um, let's say single, single falls under all other filers here, and your adjusted gross income is less than $23,000, and you put $2,000 into an IRA, you're going to get $1,000 back. You get a tax credit. It's better than a tax deduction. It's $1,000 of actual money that you get because you contributed to a retirement plan, even though your income is fairly low. 23,000 is low for a mid-career person. It's very low. For a person who's 20 years old in their first job, maybe it's not that low. Maybe they really qualify. And you might want to let your adult children know that this is a good reason to um, start a retirement plan, even though you're not rich yet, not earning enough. And notice um, here, let's say you're married filing jointly and your income is $76,000. That's not nothing. That's a respectable income. And yet you can still get 10% free credit if you um, contribute to a retirement plan. So the saver's credit is very important. Now, one other point, because I do talk fast and we're covering a lot of material. If you come away in a blur later and think, I know I heard some important stuff, but I don't remember the details. I want you to just Google saver's credit IRS. I copied this information from, from the IRS website. The IRS website, irs.gov is quite well written and everything they say there is true. They make the rules, so if they say it, it's true. You can trust it. And so if you vaguely think you might qualify for the saver's credit, just check it out there. Okay, one more super. So I, I wanted to interrupt. Um, I want to let everybody know this presentation goes to 1.30. Thank you. Okay, good. And we would love to have you stay, but if you can't stay, that's understandable. Um, RMDs, super important, required minimum distributions. Um, this is because while we have these wonderful retirement plans that let us save money in a tax advantaged way now, government wants your tax money eventually. So um, many types of accounts eventually you will be required to take money out of. Um, almost every type of pre-tax account has a required minimum distribution. Traditional IRAs, SEP simple and solos, 401ks, inherited IRAs, they usually all have some kind of required minimum distributions. For many, many years, required minimum distributions started when you turned 70 and a half years old. It was actually worded in a very confusing way. It was April 1st of the year after the year in which you turned 70 and a half. Um, used to be super confusing. They recently raised the ages and made it a little less confusing. So um, now if you are if you were born 1950 or earlier, your RMD age is 72. Many of you were born 1960 or later. So commonly now, you don't have to worry about required minimum distributions until you are 75 years old. Now, we already talked about 59 and a half. Right? When you're 59 and a half, you can start taking money out without penalty. When you're 75, or possibly 73 or 72, you have to start taking money out. So note that there's quite a good bit of time there between 59 and a half and 75, which is totally up to you. You can take money out of your retirement accounts if you want to. There's no penalty. You um, may pay income tax at your ordinary rate during those years on the money you take out, but it's totally up to you. You're flexible. 75 is just the age when you have to start taking money out. Um, if you have an inherited IRA, I'll tell you, the rules used to be a little bit complicated. Now they're very complicated. <laughs> In an effort to try to improve things, I mean, remember, even the Senate is 100 people with 100 different daughters in different situations. I always imagine senators trying to take care of their own daughter, saying, well, I think it should work this way. So it got very complicated. Um, so if you have an inherited IRA, I would suggest you do either some serious Googling or ideally, if you can afford it, get an advisor to help you with it, with your inherited IRA. Um, you usually have to start your um, required minimum distribution soon if you inherit an IRA. In other words, usually you cannot wait until you're old for those. You probably have to start soon. But whether you have to take a certain amount every year or whether you have to take it all out at the end of 10 years, at least, um, those vary a lot depending on your age, who you inherited it from, whether you're a spouse, how old the person was when they died. So if possible with inherited IRA, get some professional advice. Um, but with an inherited IRA, one important thing to know is as soon as you inherit it, you can take the money out without penalty. 
So let's say you're 25 years old, you're not earning much money, you inherit an IRA from your grandmother of $50,000, you really need that money now. That's fine. You can take out the whole 50,000 from your inherited IRA, even though you're young. Only drawback is you pay income tax on that whole amount. If you're in a low tax bracket, not a big deal. So that's an important thing to know about inherited IRAs is you don't have to wait till you're 59 and a half. Okay. Um, words matter. I mentioned the in, um, IRA is an arrangement. These are also important words. Um, they each have a different meaning. The reason I mention it is people often use them somewhat carelessly, of course, because they don't spend all day thinking about it like Chris and I do and a few others. Um, so if your advisor tells you to convert money and you call Vanguard and say, hey, I'm supposed to roll this over, the right thing is not going to happen because a conversion and a rollover are not the same thing. A conversion is usually a taxable event. Okay. A rollover is usually not a taxable event. A rollover would be move money from your 401k to your IRA, but don't take it out. Um, a conversion is usually something like take pre-tax money and convert it to a Roth. Often it makes sense to do, but you're going to pay taxes at the time you convert. A distribution is when you're taking money out, very often a taxable event. Um, a distribution and a rollover are not the same thing. So to talk all day about what these terms mean would not be that helpful. The important thing is listen carefully. If an advisor says do a conversion, don't say do a rollover. OK, keep in mind that these terms all have real meanings and they do matter. All right. Now we can get into some more advanced topics since we fortunately have more time. But for those who do have to leave, I want to give you a summary of my best advice. First thing is always check your beneficiaries on your retirement plans. It's cheap, easy and free. I always tell clients you can be Googling this on your phone right now and doing it without even you know, breaking eye contact with me. Go into your accounts, check your beneficiaries. You don't have to pay a lawyer. You don't have to write a will. Um, and your beneficiaries don't know, have to know who they are. But it's super duper important because your beneficiaries outrank a will. So for example, if you pay a lawyer a lot of money, you set up a will and you say, all my money goes to my children, but your IRA says it goes to your high school boyfriend, your children don't have a chance because that's not how it works. The beneficiary is more important than the will. So you wanna make sure this is up to date, your beneficiaries. And again, it's free, you can check it today and make sure that you've done it for every type of plan that you have. Okay, next thing is never, never, never miss out on getting your company match. That's the number one most important thing you can do to make sure you don't give up free money. Um, second advice is maximize your tax deferred and tax free savings. Know the limits each year and fill them up if at all possible. That means that $23,000 a year, if you have a workplace plan, $7,000 a year if you have an IRA. Do your best to fill that up as much as you possibly can. Uh, don't ever go over the maximum because then it's a pain in the neck. You got to take the money out. If you're saving for your children's education, as I said, fund your retirement plans first. Take care of yourself first. It will not um, interfere with your financial aid. When you leave a company, you do not have to roll over your money to an IRA. A lot of people think you have to, you don't have to. Again, there are pros and cons to doing it. If you want my free document, I'm happy to send it to you, but that's not a commercial for anything. Um, and don't ever roll over your IRA, your 401k to an IRA if you ever want to do a backdoor Roth. A little bit of a complicated topic, but I'm going to put it here anyway. For a small business with no employees, start a solo 401k. For a small business with employees, start a SEP IRA. If you have a 401k plan at your employer and you also have a plan because you have a day job and a business on the side, fill up your employer plan first. That's because of QBI, qualified business income, which is far too complicated to explain today no matter how fast I talked. But trust me, if you have both, I want you to fill up your employer's 401k first. OK, um, try to fund a Roth IRA each year if you can. So that means, you know, if your income is below that 140 or so thousand and you've put 23,000 in your workplace plan, try to also fund your Roth IRA money in your Roth. I want you to invest that money aggressively. Aggressively usually means in stock funds. The reason for that is the whole point of the Roth is the tax free growth. So if I put money in my Roth IRA and they just leave it in a checking account or something, Eh, why did I bother? But if I put money in my Roth IRA and I invest it in a stock fund and it triples in value, 
I get that tripling for free. So you, you want your safe money in your regular checking accounts and things. You want your Roth money invested aggressively in something that's really going to grow. Item number 10, see if your company offers a mega backdoor. So mega backdoor is a super valuable thing, but for most people, it's irrelevant because it all depends on whether your company's 401k allows it. So if you work for a good company, ask your savviest friend or your HR director, hey, can we do the mega? Um, but if you don't work for a company with a good 401k, don't even worry about it. It's not for you. So just find out if your company offers it. All right, FAQs. When should you do this? The answer is now. I actually took a phone call from a prospective client a few days ago who's in his 40s. We talked about all of his financial issues, buying a house, putting the kids through college, yada, yada, yada. And then he said, would you tell me honestly, do you think it's too late for me to do planning? Um, that's insane. I hope he's not on this call because that's crazy. Um, like with this old story, where was it? Yeah, as far as the old story about when's the best time to plant a tree. The best time was 30 years ago. Second best time is right this minute, okay? So right this minute is the one within your control. If you're not saving for retirement right now, start today. And I do mean today. You can go to your company website today and sign up if you're not. These are questions I get, like, should I wait? Can I, can I interrupt for a second? We have a question and it, it relates specifically to a number that I don't remember what, okay. what was on the number. It says, does number four apply only if you're going from one employer to another rather than retiring altogether? What was number four? Oh, um, number four, when you leave a company, you do not have to roll your money into an IRA. That's true no matter what your situation is. It doesn't matter if you're going to a new company. Now, if you're leaving one company with a 401k and you're going to a new company with a 401k, your new company's 401k might allow you to roll the old money into the new plan. If they allow that, that's probably a good idea for various reasons that are on my chart, but if, if possible, I'll ask Chris and Jonathan later, if there's a way I can send you all the chart without you having to visit my website, that would be great. I'll see if I can do that. But meanwhile, if you have a new 401k and they let you roll in money from an old 401k, that's probably a good idea. If your new plan doesn't allow that or you don't have a new plan, you can roll to an IRA, but you don't have to. Usually you can leave money in the old one as long as you want. So I want to add also, this makes people's head spin, these two words, backdoor Roth, and mega backdoor. And I just want to make um, clear to everyone on this call, those are different things. They're very different. Very different. So and I have about a hundred slides about them <laughs> if we have time. <laughs> so we might come back to this. And then there's also uh, Larry Pond did something, a presentation. So he's a, he's a tax professional who does uh, presentations through their library as well. And we'll be doing our tax update at the end of the day today. Um, he's got uh, a video on the YouTube channel for the library that's in the chat, but also um, the library can direct you there. It's called All Things, Everything Roth. So there's other stuff too. So that you can hear these opinions about the different pieces of backdoor Roth and mega backdoor Roth and all the other stuff yeah. from Heather and Larry. Yes. And I agree. And often when I ask people, what topics do you really want to hear about? They say backdoor and mega backdoor. And I think it's often because you hear those buzzwords all the time, especially if you live in the Bay Area and your friend works for Google and they're making a fortune. They're all saying, oh, you should do a backdoor run. Um, it may have nothing to do with you. The fact that you hear about it every day does not mean you have to do it. So two points about that. One is you can only do a mega if your company allows it. They either do or they don't. It's a company plan thing. And you can ask your company. If you don't have a company plan that allows it, forget it. That's the mega. With the backdoor Roth, it's only if your income is too high to do a regular Roth. So if you make less than $140,000 a year, just put that word backdoor out of your mind. It doesn't matter. I will talk to you more for those of you who can stay till 1.30. I'll talk to you more about how they work. But I want you to really focus more on the basics. Both of those backdoor things are not for everybody. And I don't want the complications of those to slow you down from doing the normal, ordinary stuff. Okay, I think we answered the number four question. Any other urgent questions? Okay, good. All right, N next FAQ. One of the things that slows people down, oh, I can't join my 401k because I don't know what to invest in. If you don't know how to invest and you don't have a trusted advisor you can ask, just choose the target date or the lifestyle fund. It's a mix of investments. It's a lot better than nothing. You don't have to think too much and you'll get started. 
And you can always say to yourself, you know, later when I talk to my uncle who's good at investments, I'm going to get a better idea. Totally fine. You can change your investments within your retirement plan anytime you want with no tax consequences. So just get started. If you don't know what to do, the target date, fine. Okay, now we come to advanced topics, which I'm happy to go into, but let's make sure we haven't confused anybody on the basics first. Any other basics questions? Um, thinking back to the one, someone did ask about a 457 before. So um, I have, um, someone had posted quite a while back, the difference between a 457, a 401k and a 403b. And maybe uh, Heather, could you just kind of go through the different types of 457, given the fact that there's the non-government versus the government and, you know, ones that can be combined. So maybe spend a moment on this. A little bit. Yeah. There are different types of uh, 457s. The primary difference is between the 457b, which is common, 457f, which is very uncommon. Um, you don't need to know that. Um, the main point about a 457 is that um, it will be in addition to a 403b and other things. Um, and it will allow you to double dip. You can put 23,000 in your 403b and another 23,000 in your 457. That's fantastic. The other major difference, which I didn't yet get to on a slide, is the rules for taking money out without penalty are a little bit different. With the 403b or 401k, you usually have to be 59 and a half before you can take the money out without penalty. With the 457, you can take the money out without penalty after you leave your job, no matter how old you are. After you leave the job where your 457 is, big deal. 457 has its own list of three things that allow you to take money out without penalty. One is you left your job. One is... Um, unforeseen emergency. That's a term that is not defined, but it's a little more extreme than the also undefined term hardship. So unforeseen emergency, um, leaving your job or turning, I think it's still 72. So any of those things will let you take money out of your 457 early. So if you are trying to make a decision, like I used to be a full-time employee of the University of California and I work with a lot of people there. The University of California has a huge benefits package, um, many different things. And they, whatever position you're in, you probably have access to at least three retirement plans at once. So deciding which one and where to put your money, assuming you can't afford to fund everything to the fullest, deciding where to put your money is important. So one reason you might choose the 457 over the 403B if you have both is if you think, you know what, I'm kind of young and I might need that money again. 457 is a little more flexible if you're going to leave your job. So that could be important. Now, um, the difference between government and nonprofit ones, in a sense, doesn't make any difference to you because whoever you work for is whoever you work for. You're stuck with the rules of whatever your plan is. You don't get to choose. Um, when I try to remember, though, like when I make students memorize the differences, I tell them, keep in mind that government makes the rules. So which plan is probably better? So the, the things where there are a few little advantages are the government plan. Like the government 457 has an over 50 catch up. The nonprofit doesn't. Um, a few things like that, but not important. I mean, I find it very unlikely that you're going to be able to maximize all your plans at once and still be worried about another over 50 catch up in your second plan. So I wouldn't worry too much about that. Does that answer our 457 questions for now? Let's see. I think so. Okay, good. Um, let's see. I'm scanning through the chat myself. I'm seeing both Jonathan and Chris are putting helpful resources and things in there. Um, okay, someone says, can I put 12,000 a year total in IRAs? I think we already covered that. The answer we did. is okay. yeah. All right, then I'll stop scanning. All right, we'll get into some um, advanced topics then. Can I, can I yes. ask one quick question? And this was earlier, um, it was posted earlier when you were talking about the saver's credit. So the saver, and sorry, <laughs> I was typing at the same time. So I, my yeah. ears weren't completely open. Um, the saver's credit is now changing from a refund on the tax return to some sort of automatic distribution. Is that correct? Or am I, am I on my head right now? Um, I haven't heard about that, but I wouldn't worry about it. If you're eligible for it, you're eligible for it. And if you can't afford to get tax help, 
I want you to go to VITA, V-I-T-A. That's mm -hmm. a program sponsored by the IRS, trustworthy, trained people who will help you do your taxes for free. I think that's a great reminder because this is available to a smaller number of people just, you know, because there's in income limitations. Um, so, yeah. yes, yeah. using the using the VITA or the tax aid, uh, tax aid.org is a great suggestion because there's yeah. tax is complicated. It is. But the saver's credit is not meant to be complicated. Like if you do your taxes on um, TurboTax or anything like that, it's going to be calculated automatically. You're going to say, I contributed X dollars for, to my IRA and I made this much money. It's going to be calculated automatically. The reason I like to talk about it is because I want you to know that you're going to get a reward back if you contribute to your IRA. Because you're going to make that contribution decision probably before you file your taxes, and then it will just be a nice surprise that you get this credit. But you shouldn't have to worry too much about how the credit is applied, because that should happen automatically. Okay, I'm going to peek at the number of people to see if there's still anyone here before we go on. <laughs> Do we still have people here? I can't Six, we have 61 people. We have oh, lots of people. <laughs> okay, so we'll assume that means people are interested in this backdoor thing. All right, um, so advanced vocabulary. A recharacterization is what happens if you put money in a traditional and then you realize you shouldn't have and you have to move it out or something like that. Um, backdoor Roth and mega backdoor. Okay, um, I say for people who really like silly terms. So the reason I say that is people in this business and some of you on the chat know these terms, right? You're saying, hey, I heard of the mega. What's the mega? You will not find the term mega or backdoor anywhere on irs.gov or anywhere in your 401k's summary plan description. So that's a little confusing in itself, right? Everybody's chattering. You got to do the mega. And you're like, I don't know. What's the mega? It's not an official term, but it's also what everybody calls it. So same with the backdoor Roth. There's not really a thing called a backdoor Roth. There's not an account called that. What it is, is it's a way for, again, high income people to circumvent the income limits and get money into a Roth IRA. So your goal is to get money in your Roth IRA. The maneuver is called the backdoor thing. All right. Um, so big warning, the backdoor Roth strategy does not work if you already have money in traditional IRA accounts. And I'll explain why, but I put this in red because this is one of the biggest mistakes I see people make. Somebody says, hey, you should do a backdoor Roth. And they go through the motions, they end up with a big tax bill because they didn't understand the way that it worked. So the way it works is, and this is more about the warning. Let's go to the process. Okay, so first we know why a Roth IRA is great, right? We want as much money as we can get into Roth IRAs because you get tax-free growth and in your lifetime, there are no required minimum distributions from a Roth IRA. So Roth IRAs are great, but remember there are Roth contribution limits. First of all, total of $7,000 a year plus income limits. This year, if your adjusted gross income is more than 146,000, you can't put the whole amount in. If you're married filing jointly and you make more than 230,000, you can't put the full amount into a Roth IRA. So this is what the backdoor Roth was invented to get around. It's for these income limits. So I can't stress this enough. If your income is less than this, just go get a snack and forget about the back door. The back door does not matter unless your income is too high to do it the normal way. Okay, so here's how it works. This is a trick, but it's legal. I'm not gonna advise you to do anything illegal. Um, so first of all, there's no income limit to contribute to a non-deductible traditional IRA. So you call Vanguard or Fidelity or Schwab or somewhere and say, I want to open a traditional IRA. You can say to them, I want to open a non-deductible traditional IRA. They say, I don't care whether you're going to deduct it. That's not our problem with the bank. All they care about is you want to open a traditional IRA. So there's no income limit to do that. Then you put your money in there. Um, whoops, this should say 7,000. I'll correct that before I share this with anyone. Um, so there's no income limit on who can convert money from a traditional to a back, sorry, to a Roth. There used to be. That's why this has been talked about so much recently. Until about 10 years ago, you could not do a conversion if you made over $100,000 a year. They lifted that during the financial crisis to get more people to do conversions. So now any high income person can do this. 
Um, so you contribute the maximum allowable amount, which is $7,000 or $8,000 a person to a non-deductible traditional IRA. Then you convert it from the traditional to the Roth. Then you have money in a Roth IRA. Um, so, but then the question is, it's still only seven or $8,000 a year. Is it worth the trouble? So the answer could be no. It can be a pain in the neck. I've certainly worked with people that I should have charged $8,000 a year just to fix the problems that they messed up on their tax return. It's very easy to mess up a backdoor Roth. Um, and I have to restrain myself to use the term mess up. You know what I want to say. Um, so try not to mess it up. And I'm going to jump back now to this thing. One of the ways to mess it up is if you already have money in a traditional IRA account. Here's why. If you have some money that you've already deducted, that's in a deductible traditional IRA, first of all, congratulations. It's great you've been saving in an IRA. But let's say you have money in a traditional IRA, maybe because you rolled money over from an old 401k. So maybe you have $100,000 of pre-tax money in a traditional IRA. Then you're going to do the backdoor. You put 7,000 in a non-deductible traditional IRA. And then you say, I'm going to convert that 7,000. The government does not allow you to pick and choose and say, I'm going to convert that new 7,000. They say, fine, you want to convert 7,000? We're going to put about 2%, not that good at math in my head, but we're going to do what's called the pro rata rule. They're going to say all together, you have $107,000 in IRAs. We're going to take for the conversion, some of what's in your pre-tax and some of what's in your after-tax or your non-deductible. So if you have a lot of money in pre-tax from a rollover or something, most of that is what's going to get converted when you do the conversion. And when you convert pre-tax money to Roth money, you pay full income tax in the year that you convert. So what that means is if you have no other money in traditional IRAs, then it's totally fine to put $7,000 into a non-deductible IRA and then convert it. Because what will happen is you will convert $7,000 of money that you never deducted in the first place. So there's nothing to be taxed. It just gets converted into the Roth IRA. It's a um, reasonable and sensible thing to do. But if you have money in a traditional IRA, you're going to trigger taxes when you do that conversion. So if you really want to do the backdoor Roth and you have money in a traditional IRA, what you do with it is... See if your company plan will let you roll that traditional IRA into the company plan. Once it's in a 401k, it's out of the way. Okay. Now, this I mentioned earlier that there are a couple of things that behave like IRAs in some situations, like a SEP IRA and a simple IRA. Simple is not very common now. SEP IRAs are common. So let's say, for example, you have a business on the side. You've opened a SEP IRA. You've got $100,000 in that SEP IRA and now you wanna do a backdoor Roth, don't do it. Because that SEP IRA in this situation counts as pre-tax IRA money, and it's gonna interfere with your um, backdoor Roth. Now, those are the main um, issues, but I know they're complicated. So I'm gonna stop and peek at the questions again to see who I've lost. Well, there's a, there is a question about, um the traditional and Roth in different banks. I'll oh, let you address that one. Doesn't help one bit. <laughs> Again, remember, you are one person, the IRS is one agency, and the relationship between those two is what, what matters, no matter how many banks, doesn't help a bit. You could confuse yourself more and cause more trouble by having different banks, but no, it doesn't help. Um, Do you want to jump on the question above that, even though it's a different topic? About that? Uh, the, the one from Sophia up there, just above the question you just answered. Oh, above that. Okay, just a minute. I don't think I see the names. Okay, someone says, I have deferred compensation. My husband has a 401k. We filed jointly. Our adjusted gross income is billions and billions of dollars. I think that's extra zeros. Okay, 230. Are we still qualified to fund a 401k? We filed jointly. Um, okay, I think this Oh, no, I'm sorry. Are we still qualified to fund a traditional IRA? Um, you can fund a traditional IRA, but you cannot deduct it. Remember, no income limits to put money into an IRA, but there is an income limit to deduct it. So again, 
Anybody can put money in a traditional IRA. But if you're not doing this backdoor stuff, I wouldn't bother. I would not put money into a traditional IRA and not deduct it. It's kind of not even worth the trouble. Um, I would only do the traditional non-deductible if it was going to work to do the whole backdoor thing and actually get that money into a Roth. Otherwise, I think it's more trouble than it's worth. Now, this person mentions that her husband has a 401k and she has deferred comp and they have a high income. I would definitely, in that case, because they have a high income, I don't know what companies they work for, but I would check your company plans and see if there's more opportunity there. Like if your company plan allows you to do the mega thing, or if you've got some other way to save more for retirement, I do it that way. Also, she mentioned she has deferred compensation. That general term deferred compensation is pretty broad. It can include a lot of different things, but sometimes a deferred comp plan might allow you to save a lot. And if that's true, again, it's going to be a lot more bang for your buck than this whole complicated $7,000 thing. If you're in a high income bracket, this is peanuts. Although maybe, deferred comp, that's true deferred comp, where you can save a lot, has a lot of issues that you need to be aware of as well. So that's more complicated yeah. and beyond our scope. <laughs> but I would still say, don't bother with the um, non-deductible traditional unless the backdoor thing is going to work for you. Any other backdoor questions? Because it is confusing. No? Okay. Then we'll jump on. Oh, that's nice. Someone sent us thank you. <laughs> thank you, Chris. Okay. Um, We'll jump on to the mega then. So again, this only works if your company plan allows it. Now, sometimes I work with entrepreneurs. Like I was talking to a young man the other day and I was asking about his company benefits. He's with a startup. And he said, oh, you know what? I'm in charge of designing our company benefits. So I said, okay, then we'll talk because um, I've got some good ideas for you. Um, so, and if you are a solo entrepreneur, you can set up this type of plan. Also, if you work for Google or Amazon or Waymo or lots of other big tech companies, the mega backdoor is common. If you work for the University of California, they also allow it, even though they're not a big tech company. Um, so it's worth asking about. Um, it's become a real thing for highly compensated tech workers. So I think if you work for any of those very highly paid tech companies, um, ask about it because if they don't have it, they probably need to get it to be competitive. So again, the term mega is slang. It's not going to appear in your plan, which makes it a little tricky. So what you do is you get your summary plan description, abbreviated SPD, you look for after-tax contributions, and you look for in-service withdrawals. Those are the two keys that tell you you can do this. Now, one confusing thing, as I said before, Roth money is after-tax money, but this is a third category. This is not pre-tax, it's not Roth, it's after tax, and it will be called after tax. So when I get a new summary plan description, I, I do a search for this term. Okay, um, so you can contribute to your after tax account, and then you can roll that money into a Roth. Different companies handle that differently. Sometimes you open a Roth IRA outside and you roll that money over. Sometimes like at Amazon, Amazon has an incredible 401k, the best one I've seen. First of all, they give you a huge match. Second at Amazon, they do the conversions for you. You save as much as you want in the after tax, they turn it into Roth money along the way. So you wanna find out if your company does this, you wanna ask your savviest friend, hey, how does this work? And you do it the way they do it at your company. But the way that it works is you put money in your after-tax account, and then you move that money to a Roth one way or another. So why it's called a mega is because you can get a lot of money in. The amount you can put into your total 401k altogether is limited to 100% of your salary or $69,000, or if you're over 50, $76,500. Now, probably you're already putting in your $23,000 in pre-tax. Um, and your company is matching. So let's say you work at Amazon, your company matches 50%. So at Amazon, um, you get $23,000 that you've already put in, then you get the $11,500 of your company match. So $34,500 is already accounted for, but remember the total limit, because you're a young whippersnapper, is $69,000. So that means there's thirty-five, sorry, $34,500 of extra space 
in your 401k. Between the 69,000 max and what you're already contributing and what your company's contributing, you can put $34,500 in there, get it right into a Roth. So if your company allows this and you're a high income person, this is unbelievably valuable and don't pass it up. Hi, Jonathan. He's going to kick me out. <laughs> oh, I just, we, we have uh, reached one third. I understand. Um, so um, yeah, I just, I, I really want to express my gratitude to both um, you, Heather and Chris. Um, this was a, a fantastic presentation. I learned a lot. Um, we got a lot of great questions there. Um, before um, I'll let you uh, wrap it up, um, but I do want to say um, if you have more questions, um, please visit um, our website. Um, I'm going to put the link to our personal finance page. Um, you can find links to services uh, that include opportunities to meet one-on-one -on -one with CFPs through Advisors Give Back, and you can also meet with uh, financial counselors through the San Francisco Financial Empowerment Center. All that information is on that web page that I just posted. And also throughout the program today, I was posting um, some links for upcoming programs, including two more that we have today, um, one on California insurance, um, which is a very timely topic. And then Larry Pond um, will be providing a tax update. Those are always great. So please join us for those. And we also have um, a program in November and Heather's doing another program at the beginning of December. So um, check out those links in the chat. And also you can always find these events on the library's event calendar. Um, so again, um, thank both of you. Thanks both of you. Thank you all of our attendees today. Um, it was a great turnout. Um, and yeah, we look forward to seeing you in future programs. Um, I'll let uh, Heather and Chris take us out of here. Okay, I just wanna say thank you so much for coming. We really appreciate it, especially those of you who lasted the whole time. And remember that while we went through a lot of complications, the simple thing is you should participate. You should be saving for retirement. It's very good in many ways. Don't let the complications slow you down. And I just wanna say thank you to both of you for all the hard work of getting us here and making this presentation. So grateful to all of you and thank you to everyone who attended. Thanks again. And yeah, everyone, um, keep an eye out for an email from our department, uh, the Business Science and Technology Center. We'll be sending out a link to the recording, um, and, as well as a, a, a very, very brief uh, feedback survey. Um, those are really important. Please take a moment to fill those out. Uh, that's how we come up with uh, ideas for these presentations. So um, yeah, keep an eye out for that, that email. Thanks again, everyone. Uh, we're going to end this program now. Have a good day. Happy Financial Planning Day.